Battery Generation, brought to you by Celeste. Welcome back to Battery Generation, your podcast on electromobility and European battery research. In our last episode, we've talked to the Swedish professor Emma Nierenheim from Northvold. She promoted these enormous efforts on battery recycling up there in northern Sweden. And that made me think, when is a battery actually useless and ready for recycling? And more importantly, how do we maximize the lifespan of batteries in the first place? So today we will talk to an expert for battery state of health. But before, dear listeners, if this is the first time you're listening to our podcast, click on subscribe or rate our podcast in Spotify, Google, or Apple Podcast. Or you may as well send us an email at hello at batterygeneration.com with a battery topic of your choice. In our podcast studio for today, welcome Professor David Howey from Oxford, UK. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Let me introduce you to our audience, Professor Howie. You are a professor of engineering science at the University of Oxford, and you hold a tutorial fellowship at St. Hilda's College. Your current research is focused on modeling and managing energy storage systems for EVs, as well as grid and off-grid power systems. And very interestingly, you're a co-founder of a spin-out company called Brill Power. We have to talk about this at the end of the podcast, once more, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. Professor Howie, among other research, you are analyzing the performance of commercially available batteries. How can I picture your lab work or your work in general in Oxford? Yeah, so I guess there's nothing like an average day here, but in terms of the kind of research that we do in my, in my group, um, we have a mixture of experimental and modeling work. Um, and uh, increasingly, we also do a lot of data analysis um, of data from companies, external partners, industry partners. Um, we have a small lab here. Our lab, I guess, is, is mainly kind of electrical engineering lab. So we have battery test channels. We uh, have thermal chambers. We have lots of things for making electronics, oscilloscopes and power supplies and that kind of thing. Um, but we're not chemical engineers, so we're not taking things apart or making batteries. Um, we're more interested in how available batteries that you can buy today work. And so most of our tests are plug in a bunch of batteries, see how they perform, you know, try different temperatures, try different uh, charge discharge uh, algorithms uh, and so on. Um, and then we back that up with lots of modeling and simulation work as well. So you're developing uh, battery lifetime models. Um, you work with a lot of data, I guess. What is the, let's say, the ultimate goal of this research? The battery world is a big world and has kind of exploded over the last 10 years. Um, I'd say that sort of 90% of the work in academia is focused on building better batteries, making new batteries, you know, looking at new chemistries and so on. Um, but but I, I think there's room around that for engineers who want to use batteries better. So we don't just build better batteries, but we use batteries better. And uh, so this kind of systems engineering, like optimization of existing technologies and designs and stuff, which is also important. And um, so our goal is to is to do that, is to help uh, uh, use batteries better <laughs> um, through modeling and control. I wonder as a non-scientist, um, what parameters do you actually uh, develop there? I mean, parameters for, for batteries, that is mainly voltage. You just mentioned um, temperature, um, the current maybe. What, what kind of uh, parameters are you actually um, getting from a battery and putting into a battery? One of the interesting things about batteries is, um, uh, especially commercial batteries, right, is there's not very much you can measure. <laughs> it's kind of a black box, right? It has a plus and a minus. You can maybe you can measure the voltage, obviously, and the current. Uh, you can measure some temperatures on the surface, um, but uh, but apart from that, you don't necessarily know exactly what's going on inside. You you can't sort of stick a special sensor in to measure the concentration or whatever. Um, and so so a lot of um, a lot of what we do is trying to use models to actually um, pretend that we're measuring something that we can't directly measure. Um, and um, yeah, this is a difficult challenge because there's often like a mismatch between the number of measurements you actually have and the number of parameters in, in your model. But broadly speaking, as you say, it's temperature, voltage, and, and current. And then we can play around with how we excite the battery. You know, do we excite it with a constant current or do we use like a, um, a, a current that's varying, you know, with a sinusoid or something like that? 
Uh, we can also play around with the cooling conditions and we can also compare batteries of different shapes and sizes and manufacturers. And, and of course, we could also collaborate with colleagues to take batteries apart in a glove box and look at the inside layers and stuff like that. Um, but for our group, mainly we're, we're limited to you know, temperature, voltage, current, uh, what we can get from a commercial battery without destroying it. We want to talk about state of health and degradation today. Um, just get our listeners started. What is actually the degradation of batteries? I know that, you know, a battery over its lifetime, it's not necessarily getting better. Um, but what does the, the term state of health describe, actually? I guess it's something that most of us are familiar with, uh, even if we haven't thought about it, because uh, we all have a smartphone. And in our smartphone, we know, like, after two or three or four years, they seem to not last so long, right? So maybe you have to charge it, like, twice a day instead of once every two days or something. Um, so, so state of health is, is an indication of that uh, kind of health. Typically, for something like a smartphone, we're there for talking about the capacity of the battery. Like, how, how much charge can you store? Is it enough to last for one day or two days or whatever? Um, but but actually, um, I think the definition of state of health is a bit broader than that because because it depends a bit on the application. So if it's a smartphone, then yeah, you're very much interested in the capacity, um, the charge capacity. If it's something like a industrial application, like an electric train, for example, then actually your limitation might not be capacity; it might be power, right? In which case the state of health would be related to the power um, fading over time, which is really a way of saying that the resistance of the battery is increasing over time. And because on day one, I've designed the cooling system to handle a certain amount of heat, if the resistance, say, doubles or triples you know, in 10 years' time, that the battery is going to generate more heat under the same usage conditions. I, I got the uh, the loss or the fate of capacity. Of course, my cell phone um, is then working um, not uh, as long as it used to. Uh, in terms of performance, does that actually mean that, for example, my electric car wouldn't accelerate as uh, much as it used to at the beginning? That's a great question. Um, no, um, so the loss of capacity is really about like thinking like the fuel tank is getting smaller. Okay. So that would impact the range. Eventually, that's going to impact the range of your electric car, how far you can drive. But in terms of can I accelerate uh, fast, that's, um, that's about how much current can you deliver. And for something like an electric car, I think typically that isn't going to be limited by the batteries. It's going to be limited by the power electronics and the motor. Um, for other applications, yeah, maybe the batteries would, would be the limit. But for electric car, I think you know even in 10 years' time, Uh, you should still be able to accelerate really quickly, <laughs> but you might not be able to go uh, 100 kilometers. What would you say, what is a, a very normal degradation nowadays when I buy um, a lithium ion battery? So I guess I'd say that there's a lot of variation, <laughs> okay? I mean, I know that's like a politician's answer, but um, <laughs> um, I think I think first thing I say is that lithium-ion battery performance has improved a lot in the last 15 years, okay? So the batteries that I can buy today are, in terms of their degradation and their capacity fade over time, are much better than they were 15, 10 years ago. Um, uh, and then I'd say it depends a bit on which type of battery we're talking about and what the application is. Um, For something like a cell phone, for a smartphone, you're trying to maximize the energy density, right? You want to get as much energy into the small space and, and weight as, as you can. Uh, and that then leads to a uh, trade-off with lifetime. So, um, but, but it's kind of acceptable for, for phone life to be maybe five years. It's pretty good, right? I mean, uh, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm trying to keep my phone for as long as possible, but five years feels kind of good to me. Um, maybe some people are swapping them every two years. But if I'm buying an electric car, I mean, that's a much bigger investment. Um, and so I, I want my battery to last more than two to five years. Uh, and so I think how much degradation is normal depends on, on is it a phone or an electric car or a piece of infrastructure connected to the country's power grid. And I guess this maybe comes on to some of your other questions. We can talk, talk about why a phone battery only lasts two years, but an electric car battery lasts 10 or 15 years. And I'd say that the quick answer is like it's a combination of which battery chemistry I've chosen, but also how I use that, that chemistry. You just mentioned a trade-off between, you know, putting more energy into a uh, very small battery and the lifespan. Why is that? Broadly speaking, if I want more energy density from a battery, I'm talking about um, maybe pushing the voltage as high as I can, for example, when I charge the battery, 
the more I push to higher and higher voltages, the more is the likelihood of having undesirable side reactions or um, strange things happening with the electrolyte and so on. Um, uh, so, so the converse is also true, right? If I want to extend the life, then I would limit, say, the the maximum voltage and maybe the minimum voltage, and come to like a smaller voltage range. Um, and this is going to have a disproportionately big effect, right? So it's not just like linear. Um, you know, if I come in a little bit, a few percent, it's going to extend the life a lot. Okay. Um, uh, so, so I think voltage is one is is one example but of course we're also for a high energy density battery we're actually using for example thicker electrodes so we have more resistance and, and a, a lower maximum power but we can cram more more stuff into the electrodes um uh, but that does make them a bit more kind of fragile i guess you know there's there's more uh, there's more room for stuff to kind of go wrong it's more of an unstable kind of system if i can put it in those in those terms Let's maybe zoom into a battery um, uh, on the electrode and the electrolyte you just mentioned. What happens actually inside these batteries, um, speaking chemically or, or thermophysically? Uh, so there's a lot of different things going on here. Um, and they range from electrochemical effects, like uh, undesirable oxidation reduction of the electrolyte, through to uh, growth of the what's called the solid electrolyte interphase, which is this um, special layer that grows on on the electrodes, which kind of protects them, but also um, consumes lithium, which is what we want to uh, have our capacity, right? Um, so we know, for example, that there's uh, this layer, the SEI, uh, on the graphite is a key part of degradation. And we know that this layer grows all the time uh, as a function of voltage and temperature. Um, and so even when your battery is sitting there, not being cycled, this layer is still growing. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, uh, and then there's other effects, which are more mechanical effects, right? So for example, we know that if we push a lot of current in and out of the battery, the particles are experiencing a lot of stress and they can crack. And actually then we get interactions. So when the particles kind of crack, then you, you expose more surface area, which grows some more of this um, passivating layer and so on. Probably two of the main mechanisms or three of the main mechanisms are the growth of this SEI layer that I'm calling uh, uh, on, the, on the graphite, um, some kind of mechanical cracking, particle cracking effect, and then uh, something called lithium plating, which um, is when instead of the lithium uh, going in between the layers of the graphite uh, or, or in the cathode, you know, sitting in there in a nice kind of way, it starts to become metallic lithium on the surface. And we don't want this. Um, generally speaking, in a lithium-ion battery, we always want the lithium to be in a compound. Yeah, we want it to be nicely tied into a compound, not just as a metal. Um, and so this lithium plating mechanism is particularly relevant for very low temperatures or high currents, um, because the likelihood of that happening is going to be greater at low temperatures and high currents and when we're charging. So those are probably the main kind of three things that people think about when they think about like why do batteries degrade. But um, but there's as I say there's a lot of open questions there, especially about like middle of life to end of life and about interactions between all these mechanisms and so on. Is it possible to to somehow uh, reduce these reactions to a minimal effect um, somehow? Is there any battery that um you know, does not um, show these uh, internal reactions at all? I'll, I'll address that in two ways, right? So one is, yes, it is possible to change how much of these effects is happening. Um, and secondly, uh, is it possible to, to change this by design, I guess is your question as well. So can I change it by changing how I operate the battery is, is one part. Can I change it by how I design the battery? So if I pick the design point first, um, so yeah, for sure, there, there are a couple of things maybe worth mentioning. And by the way, I mean, this is a huge topic. Loads of people are working on this. Um, uh, one thing is you can get materials which are much less prone to big structural changes, right, which could lead to mechanical changes and so on. So that's why we see some battery chemistries are more stable, right? So, for example, lithium ion phosphate, uh, the cathode material is just uh, more stable than NMC or NCA. Um, similarly, if I swap out the graphite and use uh, LTO, like uh, titanate, lithium titanate, it's way more stable. Um, so, but it comes at a cost. The cost is uh, both money and energy density loss. <laughs> um, so again, that goes back to my point about about trade-offs. Um, 
If I then think about what could I do to improve lifetime from an operational point of view, so I've already got the battery, I can't change anything. <laughs> then I could think about, well, I want to avoid extremes. I want to avoid extreme temperatures, like very high or very low. I don't want to charge at low temperatures. I want to avoid extreme uh, voltages or SOCs um, because I know that degradation is going to be accelerated at those extreme conditions. And probably want to avoid extreme currents as well. Although I think with extreme currents, I could always design the cell, say, to have very thin electrodes, and then it can tolerate a higher current. If someone out there now uh, decides to buy an electric vehicle and wonders uh, how much degradation, loss of capacity, um, would be seen after, let's say, 10,000 or 100,000 kilometers, what would you estimate? What's, what's normal? First thing I'd say is that there are sort of uh, two ways of thinking about degradation, right? We can think about degradation as a function of time, right? So if I just leave the battery sitting on the shelf, don't even use it, it's still going to degrade, unfortunately. Um, and we can think about it separately as a function of cycles. So if I do 100 cycles, do I see more degradation than if I do 10 cycles? Yeah, is the answer. But I'd say there's a third thing there to think about, which is, um, am I a taxi driver? You know, Am I driving hundreds of kilometers a day? Or am I someone who only drives my car at the weekend, in which case I'm only driving like a couple of hundred kilometers a week, say? Um, and in the case of the taxi driver, I think um, the cyclic aging caused by lots of cycles every day, that's going to be driving the, the degradation. Whereas in, in the case of someone like me, you know, I, I cycle to work. I actually have an electric car, but we mainly use it like every couple of days and the weekend and stuff. For someone like me, it's mainly the calendar aging, the car just sitting on the driveway that's more important. Okay. Um, I would say... For 10,000 kilometers, you, you're very uh, unlikely to see much change at all, right? I mean, this is kind of a small, this is kind of a small number. Um, and if you just think like an average electric car battery these days, I don't know, 40 or 50 kilowatt hours, I know they go bigger. How many kilometers would you get for that? Uh, let's do some do some quick maths. It's probably going to be, if it's efficient, maybe six kilometers uh, per kilowatt hour. So, um, so every time I, I drive the car, you know, um, if it's a 40 kilowatt hour battery and I do six kilometers per kilowatt hour, I'm going to do 200, 240 kilometers per cycle, right? So 10,000 kilometers divided by 240 kilometers is actually not a very big number. That's only like 42 cycles, okay? Most good lithium ion batteries these days should last for hundreds of cycles, if not thousands of cycles, okay? So, I, so 10,000 kilometers, you're probably going to see nothing at all, actually, in terms of health. 100,000 kilometers, okay, now we're talking hundreds of cycles. So maybe, we, and, and again, it's a design choice. It depends whether the car has been designed for 600 cycles or 2,000 cycles. But, um, but I would say you might see a few percent fade in capacity by 100,000 kilometers, um, unless it's a really badly designed car or maybe a very old car, you know, 10 years old, much smaller battery, more cycles. Does that, does that help? <laughs> that does help. I know that from my cell phone and in electric vehicles, you can actually see the percentage of degradation. Um, I always wonder when I saw this in the menu of, of this Apple phone, uh, this number, I think it used to be uh, 83%. That actually um, uh, now skipped up to 88% again, which is physically not possible. So I wonder how do these numbers actually... Um, how are they measured? How does that system um, uh, come up with these numbers? That is a great question because we do a lot of research on that exact topic, um, uh, and it's it's a it's a complicated issue, right? And so so if you're in a lab and you can fully control everything, then what you do is you plug the battery in and you do a very a very nicely controlled charge um, to full to maximum voltage. And then a nice slow discharge, maybe take a few hours, and then maybe charge again, do this a couple of times. And then you'd know definitively, right, my battery capacity is two amp hours or whatever, you know, with like 1% accuracy, maybe less, 0.1%. Um, when you've got a cell phone it's, or an electric car, it's a lot harder because you don't have this kind of control, right? You maybe have some control when you're charging because then the charger has, has a bit of control. But even then, you can't tell the user, like, I need you to drain the battery to zero, please, and then plug it in and then leave it until it gets to 100%. And so somehow you have to kind of join the dots between this kind of fuzzy picture to kind of make something that 
is smooth when actually the underlying estimation is very noisy. So why would it jump back up again? I, I guess partly it could just be this this is a noisy estimate. And so maybe if I'm smoothing it over time, it, I'll get an average which looks sensible. Um, I, I don't know is the, is the honest answer. I mean, it might have been that they changed the algorithm actually. So they, they actually, you know, that's why it jumped because they, they changed their minds on how, how to do this. There are also some actual like physical effects which can lead to the capacity apparently jumping back up. So for example, if you, and this is super, super interesting topic, lots of, actually lots of, uh, Universities in Germany have done uh, interesting research on this. But um, so, if you leave a battery sitting for a long time, what you find is that the uh, the, the 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 ions and electrodes kind of stabilize in a nice way, so that you get a nice uniform um, concentration of ions. But it takes a lot of time for this to happen. But if you can do this, sometimes it actually looks like you get capacity back that you didn't have before. Because some of the ions which are in like areas of the electrode which don't get used very much kind of come out to play. <laughs> um, so it could be a physical reason, but my, my guess is for your phone, it might just be that they changed the algorithm or that there was just some noisiness in, in how the estimates are computed. Let us now talk about um, grid applications. Um, what would you say if you compare um, these uh, stationary batteries with mobile batteries? Stationary batteries uh, level out the grid, so they mostly are between 40 and 60 percent in, in capacity, and therefore they're not stressed as much as the mobile batteries. What do you see in terms of, of lifespan there? So, so I'm not sure where the 40 to 60 percent number comes from there. I, I, I would say maybe just to just to kind of push back a little bit. So. Um, it depends on which application they're being used on the grid, right? So if you're uh, stabilizing the grid frequency, right, which we call frequency regulation or frequency response, then uh, what you say is correct. So you'll probably only have a limited state of charge window um, because in a sense, the battery is being required for its power delivery, not so much for its energy. Um, and so um, you could actually probably use uh, something like a supercapacitor instead, right? You don't need so much energy. Um, and in that case, yeah, for sure. If you if you keep the SSC range within like 40 to 60 percent, uh, the battery is going to last a, a very long time because you're not going anywhere near the kind of regions where you start to have weird side reactions and oxidation or reduction of the electrolyte. And most of these grid batteries are being uh, warranted for like 10, 15, 20 years. But I would say that those warranties uh, include uh, quite tight requirements on things like temperature. So for example, if I am building a grid battery system, uh, the battery supplier is going to tell me, you need to keep the temperature you know, within like 22 degrees C plus or minus two degrees C. And if you go outside of those limits, then I'm going to penalize you, right? There'll be some like term in the warranty. Um, whereas an electric car, yeah, okay, most electric cars these days have pretty good thermal management, but there's a trade-off again. You, you probably don't want to have such a huge like thermal management system that it's going to cost a lot of money or weight or whatever. And certainly when the car is sitting there unplugged, not being used, the temperature could just be anywhere all over the place. <laughs> um, so that's a big difference. I think, um, yeah, grid batteries are more tightly controlled, probably thermally managed a bit more uniform um, uh, and, and maybe a little bit over-engineered, right? You probably have like some headroom. You probably have five or 10% more capacity than you need in order to avoid issues. Let's now come to the thermal management, which is one of your core research uh, areas. You have published multiple papers on dependencies between uh, temperature and degradation of, uh, of batteries. Uh, what are your research findings? We kind of have two things happening. So one is um, at higher temperature, the, the side reaction I mentioned earlier, the SCI, um, that is accelerated. So we're going to kind of have faster, faster calendar aging at higher temperature. Okay, so uh, so we don't want to leave a battery sitting at high temperatures for long, long periods of time without any thermal management. And I think the combination of high temperature and high voltage or high SSC is particularly bad. So, so if I lived in a very hot country, what I don't want to do is charge my electric car to 100% and then leave it in the sun every day. It would be better if I charge it to 50% and leave it in the shade. Okay. Um, so that's the first thing to say. Conversely, though, high temperatures are quite good for charging, actually. And some researchers have shown that um, if you really want to do fast charging, you should, you should warm the batteries up first. And in fact, 
some researchers in the US have even proposed building batteries which have a built-in heater, which you can apply to current to, to warm up the battery, which then makes all the resistances lower, and then you can charge it much faster. Um, so, so yeah, so that's an interesting story. So high temperature is kind of, high temperature and high voltage is bad for calendar aging, but good for fast charging. Conversely, low temperature is uh, bad for fast charging um, and probably helps with, with kind of like long-term aging. So actually we keep batteries uh, here in, in a sort of wine cooler at like 10 degrees C if we, if we don't want them to be like dying, you know, when we're not using them. Um, so I think there's a kind of a sweet spot, you know, maybe around 10 to 20, maybe 15 degrees C where um, it's good for cal calendar aging. But yeah, if we want to do fast charging, we probably want to warm them up. <laughs> So, Professor Howie, your research also includes the state of health forecasts and end-of-life prognosis. How precise are these models? And my question is, who is actually interested in these models? Are these automakers as well? Well, th there's two things, right? So one is, today, what is my battery doing? You know, is it, is it, what condition is it in today? So this is kind of like the, as we said earlier, the, the health estimate you get from your phone. Uh, can you give me that number for any battery system? Your phone does it for sure, but um, but it's actually quite hard to get that estimate, especially in a system where I'm not charging and discharging across a huge SOC range. Um, and so we've done a lot of work on the first part of that, which is just just what is the SOH, right? Based on the measurements uh, from current voltage and temperature. And then the second part is like, how, how does that behave in the future? So if I make some assumptions about the usage conditions, then how long is my battery going to last? You know, if I'm at 95% today, when do I get to 80%? Broadly speaking, you would want to, you'd want to know this, for example, if you are investing tens of millions of bucks uh, into a grid storage system and you need to raise money to do that, right? There's going to be insurance and warranty implications, uh, uh, investors are going to want to know like how long is the battery going to last. So there's clearly like a financial insurance warranty investment decision which relates to lifetime. I think, um, and that's that's the same by the way for car companies, but maybe the may, maybe the exact way that I phrase it there is more relevant for like a fleet operator, like a bus fleet operator or whatever. Um, clearly, the OEMs making passenger cars just want to make the batteries last, uh, you know, as much as a normal driver expects them to last. Um, I think there's uh, another issue for things like off-grid systems, where actually these are often in really remote areas, and uh, to replace a battery is quite tricky. Um, but you don't want to keep a lot of batteries lying around in warehouses. So, from in terms of planning logistics for maintenance, I think that's another angle here which is important. Um, and then finally, I think there's an angle which is well, if we can predict the lifetime is going to be X, then can we make a change which makes it like X plus five? You know, can we make it better by changing the control? Um, so that's like another maybe uh, intervention that you could you could make. Um, and then going to your first part, it, how precise are these models? Uh, that's a really difficult question to answer. And I think uh, the answer is not very precise. <laughs> and one of the reasons is um, that there's two things going on when I'm predicting battery life. There's the change in life, which is caused by how I use the battery. So that's like, am I doing high temperatures or whatever? Um, but there's also just an intrinsic variation in uh, cells based on the fact that they're manufactured and they have a variability, right? So it's like a population variability and there's a usage variability. Now, I would say that, that the lifetime you get is 90% going to be the usage variability and only 10% the population variability. But it's still kind of an open research question that we're working on. Like, how do you quantify that? Um, and it's a difficult one. In this podcast, we talked to Roland van der Put from Fastnet, a network uh, of fast charging stations. He told us it's quite an effort to update these very individual charging curves for EVs. My question for you, what is the challenge when you develop a charging algorithm? So the interesting thing with fast charging is... Um, you're, it, again, it's a trade-off. You, you want to get uh, the maximum speed, but the minimum degradation. And so we need to understand, like, if I go 10% uh, faster, what percentage lifetime decrease do I see? And I think what's really interesting here is people have shown is that there is a kind of a, a knee point or a sweet spot. It's not just a linear trade-off between the two. Even if you could come up with an algorithm that was going to give you 5% faster charging with, with only 1% more degradation, 
it's probably going to be quite hard to actually get that rolled out to all of the, the networks and stuff. So there's so many people out there questioning, um, should I fast charge my car in general? How much does it harm my battery? Let's let's put some numbers on this. So um, when we talk about fast charging with, with, with passenger EVs, uh, it's fast, but it's not that fast, right? <laughs> so if I fast charge my car, uh, the best I can do is maybe 20 to 80% in 20 minutes, something like that, 25 minutes. We're talking about um, uh, C rates, and I'll explain what that means in a second, but C rates of maybe 3C, you know? Um, and so C rate is basically, for those who don't know, um, uh, it's the inverse of the duration of the battery, right? So if my if my battery is charging for an hour, that's 1C. If my battery is charging for half an hour, that's 2C and so on. Um, the, what I'm saying is the best we can kind of do is maybe like a 20-minute charge, okay? And that's probably quite optimistic. People might be able to get to 15 minutes, you know, under very idealistic conditions. And I'm, these are ballpark numbers. These numbers like 3C, 4C, they are fast, but they're not like 10C, right? If you look at what's happening in motorsport, for example, you know, um, kinetic energy recovery systems and Formula One driving and stuff like that, these are operating at like crazy C rates, 10C, 20C, whatever. Now, obviously, they have batteries which are optimized for high power with, with thin electrodes. But I don't think the fast charging we have today is that fast. Um, and therefore, yes, it does degrade the cells a bit more than if I plug in my car at home overnight and it's doing an eight hour charge or C by eight. Yeah, for sure. Like 2C is going to degrade more than C by eight. But the, the difference is so minimal, especially given that like most of the aging for my car is driven by calendar aging because most of the time it just sits on the driveway. I'm not worried about fast charging. The website of Braille Power states that uh, you guys will reach up to 60% longer battery lifetime. How can you reach 60%? That's even yeah, um, half of, uh, of the lifetime expanding. I wonder where these numbers come from. So what's happening here depends on the amount of variation in your pack, okay? So if I have a battery pack, let's say I've got a big system, maybe it's a one megawatt hour grid energy storage system. Um, what, what you're going to find is that, you know, on day one, the cells are going to be quite well matched. Um, and even after one year, they still behave kind of similar. But after 10 years, they're going to be very divergent in their behavior. Some cells will be good. Some will be average. Some will be bad. And, um, you know, that sort of 60% number is, is probably from, from looking at a pack where there's quite a lot of divergence. So maybe it's, maybe it's kind of a big number. Maybe it's 20 or 30% or whatever. Um, I would still say it's going to be tens of percent. And the reason for that is because in the normal pack architecture, where I have a centralized inverter, centralized power electronics, um, as soon as I connect cells into series strings, it's like a chain, right? I'm limited by the weakest link in the chain. Let's say uh, I have a chain of 100 batteries, which is kind of where I need to be because I want the voltage to be hundreds of volts. And these cells are like three or four volts each. So I need at least maybe 100 cells in series. Let's say one of those cells uh, starts to have like 50% capacity compared to the other ones. I've lost the whole chain. I can only get to 50% capacity for the whole chain. Um, and so that's really, and it's kind of a simple, you know, it's kind of a simple problem, right, to solve. But that's really what real power is, is trying to do, is trying to say, well, that's, that's, that's a big loss, right? I've lost 99 of my 100 batteries. Um, I've lost 50% of their capacity. And it's still there. I could still access it if I had the right electronics. So that's kind of where that 60% number comes from. What do you think uh, has a greater impact on a, a bigger lifetime expectancy of batteries? Is that chemistry or is that maybe really power electronics for the future it's not really a competition it's not like a zero-sum game right i'm not i'm not competing with my colleagues who do chemistry and materials it's actually complementary right because uh they can invent better batteries you know higher energy density lower cost longer life you still need the electronics right to get the most out of the system it's a systems issue and so whatever battery you give me i'm gonna say plug it into this power electronics and you'll get more um, uh, so I think you need both. You need both. And if you've got both, then you can get a lot more out of the system. But if you only have one, then maybe you can't get 
to where you want it to be. <laughs> and actually, there's a lot, one last thing I'd say is that sometimes the power electronics really helps you when you're looking at new chemistries. So, for example, you're looking at, uh, say, sodium ion batteries. They have a very different voltage behavior compared to lithium ion. And that requires you to rethink how I design the power electronics. Um, and so actually, you do need to think about the materials chemistry and the system design at the same time, I think, to get the most out of the system. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Howard, and your expertise. Dear listeners, hit that subscribe button if you like our show. If you really want to do us a favor, send us an email with your battery topic. That's hello at batterygeneration.com. Thank you for listening. And for next time, click in, tune in, and stay charged. Bye-bye.